Ladies and gents, uh, my name is Simon Brown doing this evening's presentation. A uh, quick bit of housekeeping before we start. Power Hour will be done in an hour. What I am doing this evening, we're talking about SA Inc. stocks, and there's some backstory to that, and I'll get to that in a bit. And I've come up with 10 SA Inc. stocks, which means that there's probably another 100. Each of you have got at least a couple that you want commentary on. So I'm going to try and finish uh, five or 10 minutes before the end of the presentation, and then we can quickly run through the stocks that you have in mind. Because you've obviously come here this evening, and you've got an SA Inc. stock, and you're hoping it's on the screen, so I talk about it, and then I don't, and you're like, huh, I fought the traffic and I didn't get my stock mentioned. So I will give you answers. I will, however, give you Twitter answers, i.e. an old school Twitter, 140 character answers. We can run through the, 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 the many stocks that you have. And all of that, we will still finish uh, 6.30 because places to go and things to do thereafter. Uh, uh, that wasn't what I was looking for, but that'll do fine. Um, what else is important? Nope, let's get to the chase. Uh, <coughs> First, we step back a bit. There was my presentation in this venue on the other side in December of last year, looking forward to 2018, largely playing out. Uh, but if you haven't, it's a video worth watching. Anthony Clark did us a power hour last month in Cape Town. I appreciate we are in Johannesburg. We can have a shower up here. Um, I was in Cape Town. You got two minutes to shower. Here's the problem. I'm timing it on the side. 45 seconds to get the water temperature right. So you only have a minute, 15 seconds to shower. No fun at all. Anyway, it's worth having a look at Anthony's video because A, Anthony's great fun and B, he's an expert in it. But C as well is he focused a lot in the, the food producers agri type space. So I've ignored that entirely. I, I haven't looked at that point at all. So if you're like, oh, but where's Pioneer? Well, because Anthony talks about that stuff, and therefore I've left that for Anthony. So you can go over, have a look. The video is there. You find them all at justonelap.com slash power hour, and you can go and see what Anthony's stocks were. So I didn't want to duplicate with him. That seemed to defeat the purpose to a, to a large degree. Um, and the key thing is what we're experiencing is, uh, you know, everyone talks about the new dawn in South Africa. In truth, it's a bit of a slow dawn. Uh, but in truth, this is how things happen. Very little actually happens quickly. Things usually grind along, and then there'll be a sudden conclusion. That'll, but the, the whole idea, people are like, yeah, but like, you know, we're four months in, and, you know, like, like GDP is still only 2%, and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. The point is it's going the right direction, but it's going slowly. And we need to be comfortable with that. Things happen slowly. Markets happen slowly. And if this plays out correctly, we're talking about the next, you know, five years, 10 years, the rest of our life, who knows? We, we need to give it that patience and the time. The point is, if we look at, and this is going back to my presentation in, from December, if we look at the key points for, for, for SA Inc. optimism, they're moving in the right direction. We've 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 had Nasrik. We we've got a new uh, uh, president for the country. We've got a new cabinet. We look at some of the cabinet appointees and we say, "Ah, no, man." But you know what? Is this cabinet markedly better than the one we had in December? Yeah. By almost any metric, it's a markedly better cabinet. Uh, so we're moving forward. We're moving in the right direction. The rand is moving stronger. In truth. The rand peaked at 11.52, 11.55. Uh, was that, I think, when President Ramaphosa was um, firing and making new cabinets, etc. And the market got very excited, and now we've weakened out to around 12. And again, people are like, oh, the rand's, uh, the rand is 12. Two years ago, the rand was 17. Was it two years, three years? I remember when we fired Minister Nene the first time. Um, so, so 12 is a, is a lovely number to be at. We're seeing that strength, and I think we're going to see continued strength in the RAND, which has two key implications. First, imports are cheaper. Second, exporters struggle. Included in those exporters are commodity stocks. Uh, they, 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 they sell their commodities in dollars, and their dollars get them less czar, uh, and they're going to have it's, it's going to be tough for them. And, and you know, any exporter is, is going to find it tougher and tougher. Inflation getting better, uh, down to 4.4% for inflation. Our range is 3 to 6. The governor at the last MPC meeting said, whereas uh, previous governors, Joe Marcus and the like, were very much happy to be in the range. What our current governor and his MPC want is they want to be in the middle. They want to be at 4.5. That, that they're not targeting three to six. They're targeting 4.5 percent inflation, exactly on the nose. Which, you know, when you look at the UK, Europe, the US, it's a giant number. But I'm old enough to remember, you know, I don't know, 15, 18 percent inflation. The idea that 
that inflation might only be 4.5% for a sustained period is frankly quite staggering. There's risks to inflation. Many of those risks are to the upside more than anything else. Uh, we'll touch on that in a moment. But inflation is coming right. We're getting some GDP growth. We were at a presentation from Andrew Coleman. Is he? He's Goldman Sachs, I think, head of Goldman Sachs in South Africa uh, earlier this year. Yes, earlier this year. I think it was January. And they were looking for 2.3% GDP growth for South Africa for 2018. And they were the massive outlier. If you looked at the expectations, the next best was 1.8, and then them at 2.3, and everyone else below 1.8. What you're seeing is everyone's GDP expectations is edging higher. And suddenly 2.3 is like, hmm, not so bad. Our finance minister in the budget speech in February, he spoke about 2% GDP for 2020. And I commented at the time in a podcast I do that I hope very much he's very wrong. Because if we're doing 2% in 2020, we need a heck lot more. Indications are he's very wrong that we will, we will probably get 2% this year. We might get Goldman Sachs's 2.3. Is 2.3 a great growth rate? No. Unless you're America and you're 26% of the global economy. For South Africa, 2.3% is not a good enough uh, growth rate. But you know what? It's a heck lot better than 0.8. Again, it's moving in the right direction. Um, bond yields, our bond yields are now better than they were pre-firing of Nana. So we are back to the bond yields from the last quarter of 2015. That is humongous. It tells us, it, it, there's two implications. First is, new debt costs us a heck lot less. Now, you're paying 8% instead of 95 or 10%. That is massive. That, when you're borrowing billions, that is massively significant. More importantly, it shows humongous confidence in the rest of the world. Why has our bond yields gone from 95 to, to 8 Because foreigners and local, but a lot of foreigners, have been buying our bonds aggressively. We can see that in part because the RAND is stronger. Before they can buy our bond, they've got to buy our RAND. Buy the rand, it strengthens, and they go and buy the bonds in that sense. A lot of the buying, foreign buying we've been seeing this year so far has been in our bond market rather than our equity market. We've had some buying in the equity market, but it's predominantly been in the bond market. And the trick is quite simple. A foreigner sitting in New York looks at 8% bond yield and is like, hey, I want a slice of that. Yeah, they, can, they borrow some money at 2%. They put a currency hedge in, it costs 1% or so. They you know, South African government pays them 8% and they like, this is, you know, wonderful stuff. Their risk is that we default. The truth of the matter is countries don't default on bonds anymore. That's very 1970s, 1980s type, type point. And the reason you don't default on bonds is, uh, well, hey, you own the printing press, right? You know, you, I owe you money, go there, just give me five minutes, print off how many, uh, and you print it. And I know what you're saying, that's inflationary. Oh, but inflationary is beautiful for debt. If I owe you 100 bucks and I say, can we wait 10 years until 100 bucks is worthless, then I'll pay you. Inflation eats away the, 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 the cost of the debt, in essence, as does currency. So in truth, uh, the, the, the ability of government to repay debt is becoming easier, and that, again, is good for citizens. We still have the massive shortfall. The, the big issue with the budget, perhaps, there were many issues with the budget, but the big one was that of the 50-odd billion that, that we needed to find, uh, we found 32 billion and then promised to save money for the rest. Now, I don't know about you, but I've done those budgets before, right, where you sit down and you say, well, if I stop smoking, stop drinking, stop this, stop that, man, I'm richer than Buffett. But I never stop any of those, do I? So we need to see the discipline come through. We need, we need to see the evidence. And then, of course, the repo rate, MPC cut our rate by 0.25% at the meeting of last month. It was a closer call than we thought. There's a lot of talk of would we get a half a percent cut or a quarter percent. And in truth, the vote at the MPC was would we get a quarter or zero cut. Um, and it was a 43 vote. So it was very close. Again, this MPC is very different. This governor and his team is very different to previous in that they're going to do quarters rather than halves. We're probably going to see more frequent moves. They're going to be much more careful, and they want us to hug that 4.5% rather than shoot down to 3, shoot up to 6, and have an average. They want 45 In truth, 45 is a perfectly good inflation rate, um, and for in many purposes, a stable is better than, you know, if, if we know that inflation is going to be more or less 4.5% for the next couple of years, that's much better than well, it's going to be 3 sometimes and 6 other times. Give us a nice middle of the road, keep it nice and simple in that sense. So the case for SA Inc. optimism is there. It, it, it's still there. It's a slow dawn, but that case is most definitely still there. Um, 
there are some cases against. That VAT increase is going to add 0.6% to inflation over a temporary basis. Um, that does suggest, seeing as the real impact is 089 uh, although in truth there's no VAT on fuel and some other issues. So it does suggest some of the VAT will be absorbed by, by uh, retailers and the like, um, but that certainly does add some pressure. The problem with VAT is it never goes down, ever. In the history of ever, it, that just never goes down. Um, but a one percent was the easy one. There was a chance for two. Again, I'm old enough. I remember when we went from 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 ten to fourteen. And in fact, I'm old enough to remember when we had GST at four percent, then five percent, and when GST went from five to ten, man, that was that was like completely insane. But that was way 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 back. Uh, politically, yeah, politics is messy. Uh, I mean, I got one word for you: Trump. Politics is messy. Our politics is, frankly, by the standards of some of the politicians out there, we are actually the good guys in the room. Um, and it's slow and it's messy. The big risk, and I spoke about this in December, the big risk is actually more external. The big risk is that global markets go into meltdown, go into bear. Um, is that currently happening? I don't know. I'll get back to you in a year or two. Uh, but but you know, if, if, if the other markets start to crash or start to go into bear markets, we're going to follow. That's, it's just how it is because global investors panic. And they take their money out of markets everywhere and they basically go and stick it in cash back in their home countries. If that happens, all of those green arrows aren't going to help us one, one iota. The early evidence is that so what, what makes a bear market? The, the simplest thing. So firstly, your bear markets, of course, and your crashes, call them what you will, they come from left field. We call them black swans. It's wonderful. But what really, really makes a bear market is high interest rates. Because what simply happens is you buy equity for return and you take risk into the equation. Now, if we take a long-term return of the S&P 500 of, say, 8% or so, but you're getting in that you know, total return, but you're getting a whole lot of risk with it, but if you could buy a American Treasury bond yielding 5%, well, why take that? Just buy the, you know, buy the guaranteed 5 rather than the risky 8. Now, many people will still buy the risky 8. But as interest rates go up, some money will exit the market and will move into, the, into, the, into, into, into bonds and cash and all the rest. And so every bull market has died on high interest rates. You can go back 100 years. That's how bull markets die. The key point is that in America, we're a long way from normalized rates. No, so the Fed might be aggressive in raising rates this year, um, but even if they're aggressive this year and next year, America will be at normal rates by late 2019. Then we've got to get to high rates, and then we can kill a bear market. <clears throat> of course, something else might kill it long before that, um, and that might be trade wars. Um, Ferris Bueller, everyone remember Ferris Bueller's day off? I don't remember the movie much. But anyway, there's, a, there's an interesting scene in there where the professor is talking about boring stuff and he's talking about uh, Flutie and Mooty or something. Anyway, two guys who, who did, uh, started a trade war in the 1930s in America. And the problem with trade wars, <clears throat> excuse me, is quite simple. These two guys wanted to put uh, tariffs on two products, uh, sugar and, and sugar and wool. That was it. Two products, sugar and wool. By the time they'd finished the party, they had tariffs on 8,000 products because of all the special interest groups, including importing goldfish. Huh? <laughs> the point being is what Congress then did is Congress got spooked and they took trade tariffs away from Congress and gave it to president, which was a really, really smart idea up until November 2016. Um, <clears throat> trade tariffs, trade wars are bad. Yeah, and I've said it so many times before. What is the core of capitalism? The fact that things can move frictionlessly. Whether that be people, money, IP, products, commodities, things move. That's what drives capitalism. What do trade tariffs do? Well, they, they, they hurt that. And it's just, it's not zero-sum games. It hurts. Where this will play out, truthfully, nobody knows. But at least we have one sane politician there, and that would be the, the number 11. And uh, Xing, what's his name? The, the Chinese chap. He's probably our sanest. Tech. Yeah, so two tech stories. NASPASS is having a tough time with Tencent. That's what's hurting our market. First quarter of this year, our market was down about 7%. Half of that move was thanks to NASPASS. And NASPASS is 100% thanks to Tencent. Uh, and then the whole Facebook story in the US and stuff. Truthfully, 
course, Facebook's been spying on you. Uh, yeah, if, uh, that, that's just how it works. Um, it's our choice whether we want to be able to communicate with people or not, and and you know whether we want to really know who our old what our old school friends and families and aunts and uncles are up to, etc. Um, if anything, what there's a huge difference to where we sit now with tech than we sit at the end of the dot com bubble, and the difference is that these large tech companies today are markedly more powerful, and they're actually profitable. They actually make money which means the valuations might be stretched, but at least they're profitable. They're companies that are making money. These aren't pets.com, whose business model was to sell pet products at a price below which they purchased them. And it's, their business model was to sell at a loss. But if you've got a website, apparently that was cool and your company could be worth billions and billions of dollars. And then, of course, there's always risk to Tsar. The risk to Tsar is partly internal, as we saw with the firing of then Minister Nene. Uh, but I think that is, has, has, has moved off, which therefore brings that risk back to markets. And those three risks there, which I think are the real risks out there, are global. Those are not so much SA Inc. risks. So kind of much, we just got to sit here and say, well, yeah, if, if they happen, it's deeply unfortunate, but we can't, we can't much mitigate them unless you know, we're on a rocket ship to Mars or something like that. I think they're moot enough. Um, they're certainly not keeping me awake at night. Uh, if we look at markets, there's our top 40. Uh, we're going back to uh, middle of 2017, so a little under a year. Um, and there was our all-time high. And from that all-time high to our low down there, which was last week, we were about 17% down. That's a proper correction. And truthfully, proper corrections are a good thing. They should happen. You can't, so what the U.S. did, which was just go up and up and up and up, and in fact, I could take that chart further back and we could, that's not normal. Normal is where you have some good old-fashioned proper corrections. That shouldn't spook us. It's just markets shaking off. Um, and then more times than not, the bull market continues. And then, of course, there's that one time when the bull market doesn't continue. And the point with bear markets is that there's, there's basically two responses to the concern about a bear market. Either you look at it and you say, I can't predict this, so when it comes, I'll worry about it. But, or you take the other view, where you predict it every single day, and then when it does come, you can say, I told you so. Notwithstanding, you've been telling me so for 10 years, and you're actually just irritating. Um, and I take the former view, which is, you know what, bear markets come, and then they pass, uh, and when they come, that's fine. But I can't predict them, and I'm not in the game of trying to predict them. And there certainly is a whole industry that does. There are people there out there who will tell you exactly when. Um, they've predicted, what's the theory? They've predicted 19 of the last seven bear markets. So what am I doing? I'm keeping my long-term death to us part because I always do that. I hold those shares until they die or I die. I'm not dead yet, and many of them are not dead yet, so I hold them. So with this move to SA Inc., I'm not going massively aggressive. I'm not doing a wholesale change in my portfolio. I'm not, it's not all in. Investing all in is not an investment strategy. Never has been, never will be an investment strategy. What I'm doing, and it's been a, a gradual process where, and if you look at my portfolio, you will see that there's a smattering of SA Inc. and there's a smattering of the offshore. And we get that blend of both, and it works quite well. And when we bring it to, 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 to more SA Inc., I'm bringing it in my second tier, and I'm buying SA Inc. stocks. And I, the, the, the 10 that I'm going to talk through in a moment, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I haven't rushed out to buy because then I'm front-running you, and that is technically illegal. Um, but my, I'm going to start adding these into my second-tier portfolio, and I'll add them into, into – I'm going to do them equal weight. In other words, 10 stocks, 10% of the money into each of them, and off we go. But I don't go and sell everything else. I don't like, well, you know, ran stronger, so, man, we don't want to select, you know. It, those will stay. They, too, will survive. This, this, you know, the rand will weaken one day again. Focusing consumer retail services, we want strong niches, we like cash, and obviously you want SA Inc. What I'm looking for, ultimately, the stocks that I think can double headline earnings per share in the next three to four years. Um, to double it in three years is 26% a year growth. To double it in four years is 18% per year growth compounded. Neither of those are, are, are impossible numbers, but if we look over what we've seen the last couple of years, they're big asks. Make no mistake about that. But an increase in HEPs has a powerful effect. If we've got a company with headline earnings of 50 cents a share sitting on a 15 PE, puts the share price at 77 Rand 50. If we can get that HEPs to one Rand and we can expand the PE, 
we can suddenly see a 20 rand share. Now, I am not saying that I'm expecting every share in this list to go up 166%, but I understand there are two moving parts here. We increase the profitability of the company and the valuation goes up. There are stocks here that are on PEs of 8 and could very conceivably be on PEs of 12 or 15, which means you're going to get two uplifts, one from the profit and the other one as it runs ahead of its profit in the process. <clears throat> um, a lot of the stocks that we look at in this space in SA Inc. are already unfortunately quite expensive. Some of them I'm slightly more comfortable with the expense and sometimes there's reasons. Sometimes they're expensive because the prices run hard and sometimes they're expensive because they haven't been making much profit and we're hoping slash anticipating that that will change. Sometimes they're just expensive. Mr. Price is a, and clicks, two stocks that in the retail space are, are brilliant. You, you know, have to own them. But if you don't own them, for goodness sake, don't buy them. I mean, they're just too expensive. Uh, you know, they just, I mean, they're sitting, on, they're sitting on PEs of plus 30. It little justifies that sort of PE. And I think we'll start to see re-ratings where some of the high-priced SA Inc. stocks, people start moving out of those and moving into the, the, the cheaper alternatives. So a quick look at the ETFs and the NDCs. Top 40 ETF, too much offshore. Uh, back in February, uh, Christiere wrote an article with uh, some data from ShareNet. 56% of that index was generating offshore. Uh, Indy 25, too much offshore. NASPAS and Richmond are about 40% of that index. Resi 10 is your risk of currency, uh, which essentially is offshore. Leaving me the Finney 15, which I like a lot. Banks are not as cheap as they were a year or two ago. Um, and I, I've been blindsided by banks. I expected less good performance. I expected more bad loans. I expected share prices to be quite stagnant. They have not. The share prices have done well. Bad loans have been, impairments are down at half a percent. ABSA at 0.86 or whatever it is, is the highest of the bunch. Um, our banks are in good position. I just, it's, it's not going to be, they're already, they're at high elevations. I don't know how much they can go. And even if they can get their growth into the low single digits, sort of 10, 12%, nice. But those share prices, the PEs are already at 13, 14, which for banks is typically the high end of the range. You want to buy banks and PEs of nine or eight or something. The mid cap was my ETF pick for 2018. Unfortunately, the JSC, of course, triggers changes their constituents every quarter, which means some of the stocks I really liked in the mid cap have gone up to the top 40, and then stocks like Steinhoff have appeared in the mid cap. Fortunately for us, the Steinhoff is such a busted company that it appears at the bottom half of the mid cap. It didn't even come in at the top of the class. It was like, you dude, you go straight to the back. Um, resilient and others. There has been a slight weakening of the SA Inc. case for the mid cap, but we're still seeing more mid cap and more internal exposure in the mid cap than we are in the top 40. So 10 stocks. Looking for SA Inc. First one's Bola Metcalf, which most folks have never heard of. They do specialized packaging, basically plastic and plastic molding. So you buy shampoo, it comes in a fancy bottle. That bottle was probably made by Bola Metcalf. Their key point, so their one, their one big risk for them is that oil is an input into plastic and we've seen what's happened to the oil price. Um, that's fine, partly offset by, by Czar strength. Uh, they've sold their aborted effort to become a soft drink man manufacturer as well. They have announced that, uh, I think it was earlier this week, they've announced it. They're exiting their stake in that, which leads them back to their, their plastic manufacturing. And if we are expecting consumers to slightly start picking up and consumers are not anywhere under the debt levels and uh, uh, pressures that they were in 2007, in large part thanks to, to legislation, National Cons Credit Regulator, uh, but also in large part to banks being fairly careful with their lending over the last couple of years. We see inflation down, we see interest rates down, we see consumers spending more, uh, and part of that is therefore going to flow to, 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 to Bola Metcalf. They're an incredibly boring company, which I like. They're sitting on about 40% of their market cap is cash. Now, all of these dates are from Tuesday, uh, 10th of April, when I was pulling all the data, et cetera. But literally 40% of their market cap is cash. So when we look at a PE of 8.8, .8, .8, we could slice off 40% and actually make that PE closer to 5 if we remove the cash from the equation. 
They have typically had high levels of cash, but that 40% includes the 230 million minimum that they will receive from selling their SoftBev operation. I don't know what they're going to do with the money. And my understanding is they don't need to increase capacity. Their plants are already fairly advanced. Plastic molding is not a simple thing. It's high tech. They have those plants. Uh, they might very well, they might go and try and buy somebody else or they might return it to shareholders as, as a special dividend. This has for years and years and years been a really, really quality stock. Uh, the software was just a really, really bad deal that they tried. And they've tried for the last five or six years and they've just r never got it particularly right. Those little charts that you're looking at down at the side there, they're all over the same time frame. they weekly charts. They're going back uh, six, six and a half years back to 2012. So it gives you a fair idea. It, pretty much the stock has done nothing in the last six odd years. What I like Nice chunky dividend thrown into the equation. Nice underpin of cash, nice chunky dividend, 4.3% before DWT. Those numbers are all before your 20% your, your uh, uh, tax that you're going to pay. Um, but in essence, you get paid fairly well to hold the stock. ELB Group. So ELB Group for a long time has been a favorite, and then no surprises, the wheels fell off. And the wheels fell off, as you can see there. When I say fell off, I mean in fairly spectacular style. That stock went from 45 Rand down to about 16 Rand. No surprising, equipment construction, mining, and quarrying. Not one of those is a nice place to currently be operating in. They also have a giant cash pile. They always have had a giant cash pile. I think the directors like looking at their bank statements. They don't expect that cash pile to be returned to shareholders in terms of dividend. The, what I like about this is engineering solutions predominantly into the mining space, but also construction. They do quarrying and the like. And I had a long, hard look at construction companies. Okay, I lie. I did not have a long, hard look at construction companies. I don't like construction companies. Uh, Anthony Clark would tell you the one to buy is Afrimat. Uh, he talks about it in the presentation he did last month that his head and shoulders has preferred. He sent out an email yesterday to say that Afrimat is his, his pick in the space and 36 Rand is his price target. Um, I want to sell the shovel. I don't want to be the digger. You know, the folks who made money in the 1880s gold rush in Johannesburg or the 1860s diamond rush in Kimberley were not the gold miners or the diamond miners. They were the people who owned the shabines and sold the shovels. I want to sell the shovel. There's much less risk. Shovel's nice, low margin. You know, I sell you the shovel, you go bankrupt. You're a, your problem, not mine. I don't have to dig holes. I don't have to build roads, etc., etc. You want to be the, the shovel seller. As I said, huge cash. That has been standard for them for a long time. Obviously, when the share was up at those levels as a percentage, it was significantly smaller. Um, but a, a, an incredibly well-run, very conservative, very in many senses, boring operation. And we can see from the last set of results that came out, and you can see that the market has responded to it. Uh, that was trading update, good results, and then another trading update coming through here that they're starting to deliver and profits are starting to return into their business in, 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 in better quantities. They're not going to shoot the lights out. They're not going to double in price over the next week. But none of these are looking to get rich in 2018. These are looking over a two to three year window as it all plays out and as, as the, the SA Inc. economy gets stronger and stronger with that growth ultimately into 2020, which I'm, as I said, hoping is a lot more than the 2% odd that we were promised by our minister. Uh, key points there is that cash underpin um, and then the, the P and the dividend. The cash underpin, I don't, I haven't spoken to management here in a couple of years. Whenever I did speak to them and I say, what are you doing with the cash? They said, well, we're looking, we're waiting for something. Um, there's another company that's the same, which is uh, ARB Holdings, uh, electrical company doing cabling and the like, and also their own Eurolux, which is lights and the like. Um, and they sat in a cash pile that at one point was 60% of their market cap and of course, then the share price moves, so it dilutes its way down. But that cash pile was 300 million. I first discovered that stock in 2008, so 10 years ago, and their cash pile is now 200 million. They've literally spent 100 million in the, in, in, in the, in the period. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with the man. Put it this way. I would rather the management were cautious and truthfully not spending the money, then they rush out and say, hey, I've got money, let's spend, let's go and do something with it. Because trust me, they're going to go buy a burger in the UK and get indigestion or 
we, we know how that story plays out, right? We've been there. We've got the scars to prove it. Sasfin, small niche bank, PE 9.4. It's probably never going to get to the levels of PEs that we see of the big banks because it's smaller in niche. What I like about Sasfin are a couple of points. Uh, it's into more the SME banking. So th th they're going to be doing transactional banks, but that's never going to make them some money. They manage some money. That's quite nice. But really, uh, David Shapiro and the co and they've got uh, Sasfin Securities and all of that, and they do some pension money. But their key business has been working with SMEs, uh, uh, you know, bridge finance and all of those sort of things loans, etc. And they're fairly quite skilled in that. Notwithstanding they had a single debt go bad on them in the last set of results, which wiped out that and uh, some tax charges wiped out a chunk of excuse me, of, of, of profits from their last set of results. But if we're seeing a South African economy improving, we should be seeing that, that, that improvement coming through into the small medium enterprise space as well, which plays directly into Sasfin. It means they can lend more money. It means their impairments slash bad debt start to decrease. But here's the real killer of Sasfin, is that occasionally it's priced to book. Book is its net asset value. If you took Sasfin and basically closed down the business, paid off all the debts, liquidated all the assets, what have you got left? You've got net asset value. You've got a pile of cash. Our big banks are sitting at a price to book of about 2, 2.1 times. Sasfin is currently sitting at 1.14, which is tiny. Now, historically, what Sasfin does is it trades between one times book to one and a half times book value. And in these sort of periods where things start to improve, you expect that expansion to about one and a half times book value. At the same time, you, you anticipate an increase in the book value itself. In other words, its net asset value improves because it picks up more assets faster than it picks up debt because it's making profit, et cetera, et cetera. And you get your expansion. So forget the growth in the business. You get your expansion in the price to book of moving to around 1.5. On top of that, you will get the expansion in earnings. And then on top of that, you can further get an expansion in price earnings. This was one of my picks for 2018, which I did in the December presentation, uh, positioning your portfolio for 2018. But I brought it back into this presentation because whilst it had been doing well, it has come back on the back of those bad results. The bad results were two one-off events that are one-off. They got scammed on a bad debt that cost them, I think, 30-odd million, and they had some one-off tax charges, which cost them, I think, another 10 or 15. And those are done behind them, move on. They can get wiser and smarter for it. Long for life, uh, Brian Joffe. This is a stock, so you've got a much smaller chart here because it's much uh, skinnier in a space. Crazy, crazy PE, but that's because it's a new business. There's a chunk of cash in there, and a lot of it's not yet flowing through. He bought Holdsport, which was never a company that particularly excited me. But what is he doing here? He's basically trying to build a, 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 a diversified uh, company. And you, what are they? Those industrial conglomerates, in a sense. At, at, at their core, they are asset allocators. So what happens is, is Holdsport is a cash generator of note. Holdsport just prints cash. He then takes that cash. In the olden days, Holdsport would put it back into the business. But by now, Long for Life can say, well, actually, where is this cash best utilized? This is exactly what Warren Buffett does with Berkshire Hathaway. The money comes into the center, and the center allocates the money to where it's needed. It doesn't stay in the particular businesses as necessary, so they can grow some. So they've got that cash cow coming in the, in, in the form of, of, of hold sport. They've still got a fair pile of their cash left from their listing arrangement. Um, they've bought contract bottlers, one in the Western Cape and now one up in Gauteng as well. Uh, the Gauteng one has just been confirmed. So what you can see he's craftily doing is he's trying to build a, a national footprint for contract bottling. And again, it's, you know, sell the shovel. Don't, so don't be Coca-Cola. Just be ABI and, 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 and bottle the Coca-Cola. You take a lot less, risk, lot less risk. So in essence, what he's doing there, I had thought that he might be going for SoftBev. He didn't. But truthfully, he might become a client of SoftBev. Interestingly, they can do alcoholic and non-alcoholic. Um, and a lot of our bottlers in this country are non-alcoholic only. That's a legislative issue. It does give them more scope. But what it means is they can go and work with the smaller manufacturers of whatever it might be. It could be orange juice. It could be craft beers. It could be absolutely anything. And they've now got a Gauteng and a Western Cape. They bought two separate businesses. They can now merge it together. 
You've also got Brian Joffe, who truthfully is probably only going to be around in this particular business for maybe another five or so years. And, and not because I think he's going to, you know, suddenly die on us or something, but the man is in his 70s. At some point, surely he wants to, I don't know, sit down and, and rest. Um, I do know when he tried that leaving Bidvest, his wife kicked him out of the house after about six days. Hence, he started Long for Life. There was a lot of movement. Kevin Hedewick, ex of Famous Brands, popped up for a while uh, and then left. I, I, I've heard rumors why why he left. It's not particularly in, important in, in that sense. What he's going to be trying to do here <clears throat> is very much focusing on lifestyle within SA. Hold sport, lifestyle. He bought uh, Sorbet, which is a tiny little deal. I think he paid 126 million for Sorbet. So that really, really is very, very tiny. Um, we can see it in his contract beverage bottling plants that he's got in Gauteng and Cape Town. Very much focusing on that lifestyle uh, part and very much using his expertise more than anything as an allocator of capital. Where's that money that's at the core needed and where can it be bet, bet, bet best used for something? He's still got a fair bit of cash. I think we'll see some more deals coming through. Um, the trick with it is the stock went crazy on listing all the hype around it. You want to try to pick it up in the, in the five rand fifties, not in the sort of six and sevens. And I think it actually, it's all time high was eight rand fifty, which at that point it was a cash show. You were paying eight rand fifty for five rand cash, which was frankly negligent. Advertech. So education, a couple of points of research that are critically important. In South Africa, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, a surprisingly small quotient of our students are in non-government education compared to the rest of the world. The rest of the world, it's mostly running at double digits around the 15 to 20%. Some economies closer to 10 or 12. In South Africa, it's closer to 3 or 4%. The second important stat is that in a household with children, Education is the number one priority in terms of spend. And think about it. I mean, this is there is no rocket science in that. Um, <clears throat> people, parents want to help their children have a better life. And the easiest way to help help a child have a better life is to give them a quality education. And and this is not so much a diss on on government schools and Model Cs. I, I have no particular opinion on that. I certainly know in the rural areas education is shocking. But the point is less around that. More just the point is that parents want to be able to send their schools to their kids to better schools. Uh, Advertech also does tertiary. Uh, which we, uh, and people are saying, ah, oh, but the, the free fees, the free fees. So the biggest problem our tertiary have, I mean, how many, I don't know how many seats we have at our tertiary education, government controlled tertiary education is in this country. What do we call it? 200,000, maybe 250,000. How many matriculants do we have a year? 600,000 passing, coming out at the other end, which means there is a massive shortfall, which is why UJ gets 75,000 applications for 14,000 seats. That means 61,000 students went tried to get into UJ and couldn't. Now, we can make the debate around whether going to a university and getting a science or an arts degree is of value. That's a whole different debate. Uh, we can make the debate about whether you should go and learn how to be a, a fitter and turner or something like that, a, a proper you know, hands-on degree. Those are separate debates. The point is, is that there's a huge demand for tertiary. And what I like about the likes of Advertech is that it's not just arts and sciences and the like we see at the traditional universities. They've got advertising schools and fashion schools and all of those bits and pieces too. And truthfully, a society needs more than just doctors, engineers, and, and, and historians. We need those, but we need everybody else at the same time too. Um, and Advertech plays into that space. They're moving into Africa. They targeting 30% Africa by 2020, which does slightly dilute their SA Inc., uh, but I'm comfortable with that. Um, they're much more spread across, whereas if you look at Kuro, they've basically got the Meridian, which is the lower income where they're really struggling, and then the higher income schools where they're doing fairly well, and they spun off their tertiary separately. What I also like is they've got a recruitment division within the business, which I have Every time I see the Advertech bosses, I say to them, please, please, please get rid of the recruitment division because, man, you're a teacher. You're not a recruiter. However, at this point in the equation, I haven't seen them recently, but if I did bump into one of these folks today, I'd say to them, don't sell it just yet. Because now we're in the point where if we're seeing a better economy and growing GDP, et cetera, et cetera, there's going to be demand for skills and recruitment is suddenly going to start playing a, a more significant. So my suggestion to Advertech would sell your recruiting division in three years' time. Let's first double those profits up and then sell it at a ridiculous PE ratio. Um, <clears throat> 
In the last set of numbers, they had two things that hurt. They had some fraud that happened that cost them a bit of cash. The fraud's relatively old, but they had to expense it back out. Um, fraud always bothers me, uh, yeah, and particularly if you know, the response was, oh, but don't worry, it was three years ago. Like, ho, 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 hang on, hang on. It's bad enough that you had fraud three years ago, but then it took you three years? And, of course, there's one word to that as I think about it, Steinhoff. Anyway, um, they've put in place, they've, they've put in place uh, uh, processes, et cetera. They centralized more. It was one particular individual who was doing the fraud, um, and they've centralized uh, uh, processes to try and prevent that happening again. Um, the other issues they have is they've been losing uh, students in their, in, their, in their schools, in their, their high schools. They've been losing students. In part, they say people have been leaving the country, immigrating. I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure that we've seen that. Maybe we have. But I think also in part is that some of these schools are quite expensive, and I think parents are frankly shopping down. The trick with that is that firstly, unless there's exceptional circumstances, you don't put a kid into a school during a school year. In other words, the numbers that they sit with at this point in 2017 are unlikely to improve through the rest of, sorry, 2018, are unlikely to improve through the rest of the year. They're not likely to get massive increases in enrollments during the course of the, of the school year. Um, what it also means is if you've lost, most schools, kids are going in and at the high school level, they're going in in standard six, grade eight, and they're running their way the whole way through. I mean, things change, you know, families relocate and that sort of thing. But typically you try and put a kid, so that has hurt them a bit and it's not going to bounce back strongly in this financial year. The, real, the better impact will be coming through in the following financial year. Relative to Kiro, this to me is very much a valuation story. Kiro still got way to go in terms of getting to the numbers of students and campuses and everything else, but Kiro is just also significantly more expensive. Kiro is on a PE of closer to 50 as opposed to a PE of 23.3. The PE has been hurt by the depressed results, which were hurt by the fraud um, and some softening of the students. As I said, education is a, a top priority for families. We can push that number up. And the recruitment, as much as I haven't liked it, at least at this point, I think we can start to see some pickup there. If you want pure recruitment, uh, CSG is the one to look at, which is a small little cap stock uh, who are specializing in recruitment. They initially were basically just recruiting in for, for, for Sassel. Um, but they seem to have they've much they've widened that base a fair bit, and they're doing recruitment there. And then there's uh, AdCorp, who was AdCorp was one of those companies which I loved for years, but I could never buy it because they, it, it just never got going. It had everything going for it, but it never got going. And then some private equity moved in, got rid of all the board, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and early indications are that they're turning it around. I didn't want the bespoke exclusive recruitment. I wanted the education with some recruitment tacked onto the point. PSG, deeply boring, but we get a lot with PSG, which is quite interesting and fun. So if you're thinking to yourself, yeah, yeah, Simon, Advertech, come on, let's stop being boring. Let's go Cura and Stadio. Well, here's how you get the Cura and Stadio. And then into it, you get a nice little bank. Uh, Viceroy has their point on it. Let's quickly touch on the Viceroy theory. Um, so the main points which Vice were raised were not new. Financial Mail and Business Day wrote about these in 2016. So a year and a half ago, they were writing about these issues. What I did like about the Capitec latest set of results um, is that the areas which they claim that Vice was confused about, they expanded the amount of information that they're giving. In other words, they said, okay, you Oaks didn't understand this section here. So he has a truckload more, res more information so you can make better sense of it, which to my, re my view is a good response. Now, the truth of the matter is, you know, Vice Roy may or may not be wrong. It is opinion, but at least uh, Capitec is, is rather than putting their head in the sand or threatening to sue, which is what most of the American companies who Vice Roy have gone after have done. They said, well, okay, we think you're wrong, and he has a bunch more information. Go have fun. Um, you get Capitec Studio, you get PSG Consult, which will pick up as well. Bull markets, asset managers, stockbrokers like improving markets. You get Zeta, which is mostly Pioneer these days, with a little bit of optionality on the side. Uh, Pioneer, obviously food. The big driver for Pioneer, more than anything probably, is rain. Uh, and ideally in the Western Cape. We've got enough. Our dams are full. We don't need more rain in Josie, guys. You can stop the rain. Send it down to the Western Cape. What you do have is uh, the, some of the parts. 
which is you can basically, those are obviously all listed assets. They then got some unlisted assets and you can therefore determine what the net asset value of a business is. And in this case, PSG have, if you go to their website, psggroup.coza slash SOTP, um, you can go and find the actual net asset value as it updates. When I checked this number yesterday, PSG was trading at about a 13% discount to some of the parts. What typically happens is at a 15% discount, the Matons start buying, and at a 15% premium, the Matons start selling. Now, the Matons never physically sell PSG shares, but you remember PSG did a book build a few years ago, um, and they did it at that price there, uh, which at that point the stock had run like crazy. If PSG are doing a book build, you don't want to partake because if one of the smartest operators in the country, the Maton family, are selling stuff, you don't want to be buying it. Just ask Tiger Brands. Tiger Brands went off and bought an asset from Africa's richest man and are surprised where their 5 billion rand pasta mill becomes a 1 rand asset. Literally, they wrote it down to 1 rand. When the rich people are selling stuff, you don't want to buy it because, like, why are they selling it? Um, so the Matons, we're in the zone where Matons would be buying um, and then they typically would be issuing script at the top end of that zone. Um, of the businesses there, I mean, those the consult is cheap, Zed is cheapish, but the concerns around Pioneer, those three are not cheap. The discount there is great, but your discount to what? Look at that price earnings ratio. But what you do get is one simple stock with nice management and a nice collection of, of businesses and a pipeline of potential new businesses coming through. I know the one that they're working a huge amount on, they've got an energy fund which they're putting together in terms of renewable energy. They're looking to do a lot in that space. Will that become the next Kiro or Capitec? Uh, yeah, who knows? But certainly, that they, you know, they, they, over the next 10 years, expect them to have some more successful companies come out. City Lodge, another one that's not as cheap as many of the others in a price of 22.2, although the share has run and is trading just of all-time highs. The problem that they had is they've struggled with occupancy levels. Now, what you see in hotels is they are massively leveraged. And what I mean by that is there's a cost to having that hotel there. Whether you have one guest or 100 guests, there is a cost. Now, yes, every guest does increase that cost a little bit because they have a shower and that uses some water and they turn the lights on and that uses some electricity. But the truth is, you know, you've, and, and you've got to wash the sheets and that uses some more electricity and water. But your base cost for running a hotel is pretty much fixed. You've got to have two people at reception. You know, so that one can go to the bathroom and one can check people in. Whether you've got one person checking in or 10, you've got two people at reception. You've got X numbers. So you've got a very much fixed cost. And as that occupancy goes up, most of that new occupancy drops straight to the bottom line in terms of profitability. With uh, City Lodge, they're sitting in the mid 60% in terms of occupancy. If they can push that number to 70%, uh, they increase their profitability by 50%. Their HEPs goes up 50%. From 60, they move occupancy from 65 to 70. HEPs goes up 50%. The secret with these folks is they own most of their land. Way back in the day, oh, we need to go further back. Way back in the day, yeah, um, they were trading at the value of their land. The secret is, is it not the, the, the extra, extra secret? The land that they've got on their balance sheet, they value at cost. In other words, that hotel in Grayston Drive, when did they build it? I don't know. But the value of that land, to their mind, is at cost. Now, I don't know when they bought it, but I figure that land's worth a little bit more than when they did buy it. The buildings, they revalue every three years. They need to. They always say every five years. It's an ifris, I forget. But the actual physical land, they're like, no, no, it's worth what we paid for it, not a cent more. So there's actually a, a fairly strong underpin in that sense. What we can expect, they don't have gaming. I quite like that. I... I I mean, I have a, a, a moral objection to gaming, but truthfully, I, I'm not a particularly... I, let me try to make this sound less bad. I'm not the... I, I, <laughs> I, I don't put my moral hat on when investing. I once owned British American tobacco. My excuse was I'm a smoker, so like, you know, I'm a fool anyway. But I, I don't like gaming assets. I don't like the license scenarios. The Western Cape, they're going to throw another game in casino in there. There's issues around that. I'm not a fan of the gaming. Um, but we can start to see City Lodge is mostly business travel. They actually do very little holiday makers. If you want to go to if you want to go to Cape Town, Durban, or one of their many far flung where they've got hotels, man, City Lodge on weekends, 
nice prices because they, their key focus is the business traveler and the weekend travel pickup for them is like, yeah, it's just like cream on the top. Um, so it's saying picking up, we should see some more business client picking up and that leverage impact should come through and that should unwind the PE very, very quickly and push dividends higher at the same time. Anchor group. So you've got to go out in the limb occasionally and here is my limb. Listed a two rand a share, never traded a two rand a share. I think on day one it was three rand. And you can see the run from two rand to over 20 and then all the way back down. The problem is, is they were buying lots of asset managers um, and they had to pay higher and higher prices. Because they were a public company, we know. So put it this way, Peter Armitage comes and buys your asset company and he pays you a price. Then he comes to me and I know exactly what price he paid you. And uh, well, hey, I want a bigger price. And that he just had to start paying more and more for the asset managers. Basically, he was trying to bulk the business up to get to critical mass. So he had two problems. One, he paid top dollar for some of the assets. And two, he bought a dud, Capricorn. Well, let's not call it a dud. He, he, he bought himself a UK burger joint. His was called Capricorn. And Capricorn was a horrible, horrible investment. They now have fixed that. We can see in the last set of results, we can see that that has come better, that they've got Capricorn working again, and that should stop dragging on the business. The point with, with asset managers is that they like stronger markets for a couple of reasons. Money's coming in. They might get lucky and make some profits, and they can charge performance fees, and they've got some activity happening, and they typically make good money in this space. At these levels, PE is a bit distorted again because of the problem, but the alternative here is Signia, but they're a, Signia's a low-cost operator. Excuse me, there are no margins. They're badly overpaid for DBX trackers. The other one is Coronation. Coronation, absolutely, but coronation is expensive. You've got a very nice dividend yield on coronation. What? It's about five or six percent. So you've got a massive dividend yield on coronation, but you've also got a 600 billion assets under management and, and it's hard to outperform with 600 billion of assets under management. And you've got a PE of around 22 or 24 times. So anchors your riskier one. The market has started to recover. Uh, it does seem, you can't really see, but it does seem to be doing better down here. Is it going back to 18? Probably not any time in a hurry, but they should be able to pick up and they should be able to start getting good numbers. And most importantly, they've stopped buying overpriced asset managers, um, which means they're also not going to buy another Capricorn dud. And then cap, or the cop. I don't know. I call it cap. So probably... Most people had never heard of CAP, or if you me, I'd heard of it, but I'd completely forgotten about CAP until it, until Steinhoff happened, and it turn, turned out Steinhoff owned a chunk of CAP. A couple of important points. Steinhoff has sold a big slice. They still own 20, I think it's 26% of it. Expect them to sell that. Steinhoff is selling everything. I mean, one day they're going to, like, open their boardroom and say, Did anyone want to buy some chairs, tables, you know, coffee cups? Um, I mean, they just sold 200 million star shares today. Um this is one of the businesses that they owned, but they are they were the largest shareholder, not the majority, not they had the 40 odd percent, they were the controlling shareholder, but they didn't have that they appointed uh, they had the right obviously to appoint directors, but there's no business relationship between them. Uh, Marcus Juster has never been involved in the running of Steinhoff. He's not in any way, he wasn't on the board, he's not in the management, he's never worked for the company, he's never done anything with the company. The share price, and you can see, certainly that is when Steinhoff happened, people were worried. Um, it's still under a bit of pressure, although it has done fairly well. These are a, they are a classic industrial, I mean, you go through their logistics, their polymers, their timbers, again, it's the shovel, but there are their brands. And I mean, the, the the point around these brands is that some of them you recognize, like Claudina, they make towels. It's like it never occurred to me that someone had to make those towels. It never occurred to me that actually it's profitable to make towels. I mean, how many towels can you sell? Well, okay, now that I think about it, apparently a lot. Um, so most of the brands we look at, we never heard of. I think that's shoes. Hey? I know Bull brand, that's that funny little thing that you open with the key. Those, those were huge fun. Um, uh, I, I, there we go. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's that sort of, it's proper industrial. There is nothing exciting or fancy or sexy here. This is like the boring stuff which happens at the core of your economy, which people are eating and consuming and buying towels and stuff like that. Um, 
barriers to entry galore, some of them technical, some of them just uh, uh, brand orientated uh, for the brands that we managed to recognize. I'm running through, I know those folks vaguely. Okay, Yolks get out a lot more than I do, hey? <laughs> um, and they've just got this giant stable and it is an incredibly well-run company. If we look at that chart, during all of the horrible times, they just carry on plugging along, they carry on making themselves some money, and at the point they're on a 15 PE and a two and a half times dividend, consensus forecast for growth is 18.7. Um, I think I ran numbers, I came out at 20%, a little bit ahead of that, but that means that your growth is ahead of your PE. There will be another sale from Steinhoff, which might spook the market. So if you want, maybe a bit of patience, price around eight rand, you might get lucky in that regard. And then CMH. And I've got to tell you, I really, really didn't want to add the stock to the list because they sell motor cars. And you've got to ask yourself, how do you make money with motor cars? I mean, I know how you make money, but it just to me, I mean, I think, I think that we should all buy, you know, I, I think we should buy a car every 10 years. So over a lifetime, we should own four cars. But the truth is we buy a car every three to five years and these oaks make a fortune. They sell cars, they rent cars, they finance cars, and they are steeped in cars. These guys are astounding in terms of their results and in terms of how they manage the business and in terms of their profitability. Um, what we have seen is with vehicle sales under pressure over the last couple of years, it means means the average age of the car on the South African roads is older, which means we're going to start seeing some, we've already seen the pickup coming, but expect a little more pickup coming through. And again, you want to know what cars they sell? Uh, there is the list. I mean, is your car not on there? I mean, so actually, oh, my car is, I drive a Mazda. I mean, that's the brand. So they don't own these brands. They're not, they're not the, but these are the brands of the cars that they sell. They have Alice, they've got everything. They even got investment cars. Infinity, I've never heard of. Uh, they've got everything. They sell cars. And they do it incredibly well. Yes, Imperial sells cars and other folks sell cars. But these guys sell cars spectacularly well. No Mercedes. That's a good point. Also, no BMW. Ah. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I, I was weird. I went and I looked for the brands and I expected to see half a dozen, maybe a dozen. And it was just like, so I did, a, I did a grab and then I scrolled down the screen and I realized, oh, there's more. I did a screen grab and I scrolled and there was still more coming. Um, pretty much you could, I mean, you, you, you know, they, they're selling a lot and they just make money out of it alarmingly well. They also sell some boats and stuff like that, which was a little bit weird. Um, but they sell cars, they sell truckloads of them, um, and they're on a 10 PE and a 5.3 dividend yield. Nice play, and those older cars on the road are significant. I've almost hit my time, so if you've got stocks, quickly, throw me shares. SA Inc. shares, I'll give you my Twitter answers if you've got SA Inc. shares you want to comment on. Sir? Steinhoff. Steinhoff. <laughs> Uh, Steinhoff. Steinhoff is going to zero or it's going to zero or might just go to zero. So Steinhoff, we just don't know. The point is they're drip feeding information. The information is all bad. The board don't know what's wrong there. They haven't yet worked it out. Steinhoff might be worth there will be value in Steinhoff when this whole unravels. We don't know what the value is. Right now you are betting. Um, and if you really want to gamble, go to the casino. The drinks are free. <laughs> Uh, construction, I hate construction. I know Marion Roberts have moved out the 15 Rand offer. The valuations are typically around 20 Rand. Um, it looks like the Germans are going to get control but are not going to delist, in which case it might be worth a shot. Ellie's absolutely, it looks like they've turned the corner. Wayne Samson's gone. That's, that's sad in a sense. He built that business in many senses. Uh, highly speculative, but they, they, what I think they've done is they, they took a sharp lesson. They were too entrepreneurial. The market killed them, and they're going to come back smarter and better as a result. Very mark. So very mark had a trading update today. So very mark's a weird one. Um, so lumpy, but two things going bigly in their favor. Oh, no, I said bigly. God help me. Um, Two things going in their favor. One, stronger rand. They import stuff. They love it. Two, better consumer. Man, and they sell stuff. You know that master dicer slicer thing? They sold millions of those. Millions. How's that humanly possible? I haven't checked the valuations, but they should be in a good patch, and that trading update today was very good. EOH. EOH. 
Ah, no, leave EOH alone. They've got problems. Not quite sure what those problems are, but they're going to bite them. Those last set of results were not impressive. I know Asher talks a good story, as does his CEO. The market is not convinced. The better option is to have a look at Adapt IT. Baldwin, uh, Baldwin's interesting. So that one's Colgrave M3. Baldwin actually might be worth a shot. Um, they, they sell entry level housing. We're seeing interest rates come down, makes it more affordable. I've been to some of their estates. They really, really are impressive. They kit out those, those places. You've got a kitchen, you've got a dishwasher, you've got a, 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 a kettle and all the other bits. They put fiber into them etc. Bourbon might be worth a shot. It's been under severe pressure. I don't like the way they shifted the way they do the reporting. They've had some challenges, uh, but probably worth a look at. Uh, Woolies has probably got the worst behind it. It's not SA Inc. because they went and bought an Australian disaster. Um, but the Australia is probably not going to start getting better in a hurry, but it's probably going to stop getting worse, and the SA part should start doing better at this point. But 60 bucks on Woolies is not bad. Disclaimer, I own so many Woolies shares that I don't pay for chuckles anymore. <laughs> CIO, uh, CIO, yeah, okay, they've got some issues in Angola. I think they might sell their Angola, although the higher oil price is helping. Um, the fact that they've signed the independent power producers is going to help, but that is not going to be anything. It's going to be a couple of years in the process. They've still got debt issues coming, uh, which are on standstill for a year. I would be careful of CIO at this point. Transaction Capital was another one. Transaction Capital is an amazing little business. I don't know the valuation is really, really good. Lewis, I don't like. They're a bank masquerading as a couch retailer. Either sell me couches or sell me financial products. Don't pretend to sell me a couch, but actually sell me a financial product. That's why I never liked JD Group. I never liked Ellerines. Uh, and I thought the African Bank of Ellerines was just a really, really bad idea. Uh, and in truth, I thought the Steinhoff buying of, of, of uh, JD Group was a really, really bad idea at the same time. And Victor, uh, Hudeco and Omnia, which I'm lumping the three broadly together, um, they're quality companies. The other, so Victor's probably my pick of them. Uh, Hudeco's got, uh, the Korean thing, which is a bit Asian, which is struggling them. Um, the other one to look at that space is perhaps Rolf's as well. Um, they had some fraud. They fixed that up. They've got new team in there. They've got the chap who used to be the boss at Metrofarm, um, who's nice, boring. They're in chemicals, which is both agri and mining, uh, not bad at all. The short answer is, and I'm going to stop there because I've run my time and I, I don't want to overrun and you can chat to me afterwards, tweet me or something. But the point being is that companies that have come through the last five years being SA Inc. and have come through still making profit and have come through with balance sheets that are well intact. And there are examples where it isn't. One of them would be CIL, another would be Steinhoff. But those who have come through are well positioned. And if we're going to see, and I went back to had a look at, at Brazil, I had a look at Mexico, and I had a look at Turkey. You've all gone through what I'm anticipating us go through over the last couple of years. And the, the, the market move is fairly broad-based. Uh, the rising tide lifts all ships. Now, of course, if your ship has holes in it, the rising tide don't lift it. So don't go and buy the one with holes in the hope that it will lift because it will still just sink. The tide will come and the ship will disappear down into the equation. What I'm trying to do is... Uh, Pick those ones which I think they can perhaps do even better. They cannot just double their HEPs in three to four years, which requires 18 to 26 percent HEPs growth a year compounded, but also get that expansion on their PE. Ladies and gents, we'll park it there because I've hit my time. Uh, there's a disclaimer there somewhere that says if you make money, yours. If you don't, no longer. Uh, thank you all very much for your time. The video will be online, justonelap.com, tomorrow morning. Thank you very much for your time this evening.